friends, welcome to episode 159 of Storyteller Conclave. This is a show all about helping you run the best tabletop role-playing game that you can. Whether you're a new storyteller or dungeon master learning the craft or an experienced storyteller looking to take your game to the next level. I'm Sarah. I'm Rob. How we doing, Rob? I'm cold. Yeah. It is cold in this it's room. Little, but we have hot tea. We do. It's actually steaming. <laughs> It's kind of crazy how much it's steaming. Uh, I I am uh, after several days of eighty degree weather. I am wearing a sweater. You are. Uh, you are wearing Michigan. a sweatshirt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm wearing a hoodie. I'm about to put my hat, my hood up. It is fifty and raining all day. Oh my god! It's... My cat has spent all day in her heated bed. So have mine. Yeah. So. so. Yeah, definitely been one of those things. But other than that, has been good. Over the weekend was great. We had Mouse Guard. Yeah, um, yeah. Mouse Guard was a probably phenomenal game, man. Like a, a key reason why we game. We we all came into that kind of just low energy. Yeah, and by the end, we were feeling great. Uh, I slept bad. You slept worse. Yeah, I was really in a bad point. Um, there was there was a number of people who were just like, eh, I'm I'm not feeling there emotionally but yeah. eh, we'll game we'll see how it goes and and it was one of our players second game yeah 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 and just just an absolutely phenomenal game um yeah. uh the mad elf uh mm-hmm. who's our storyteller for that uh, for that game um incredible uh, job. we had some really good really good discussion about um the storytelling style and the the amount of time allotted for role play and stuff like that mm-hmm. and exploration of our different characters' themes and whatnot. Um and uh took that feedback and I feel like executed it just perfectly. Yeah. Um and uh phenomenal. I'm just probably the best game of Mouse Guard so far. But was one of the neatest things that he did that we we do is sometimes is he went around and asked us, like literally did a gauge of like how are we doing? Before yeah. we started anything, not like in game or anything, like where are we at to be able to gauge how the day would go. Well, there's yeah, there's that, but it, yeah, the, the other thing too is that he's a mental health professional, which helps. <laughs> and so you know that when at least he asks how you doing, he's yeah. not asking for like a, oh I'm fine, you know, pleasantry. He's asking like no really, like what's the vibe, you yeah. know? Yeah, you, which good. There's something to be said. For that, like having that as a DM, uh-huh. you know, because that adds a whole layer that you're unexpected. But at but the same time, it was a like, great check. Yeah, yeah, it was a great check, and it helped, and it gave us all the right place, and gave him a mind frame of where we were at, so he wasn't going too far. I think mm-hmm. all in all, fantastic. Yeah, like absolutely. it was just another great way of doing it, and another proof that we have <laughs> we have a really great gaming community that we're in so really you're very blessed and we would like to make sure that everyone's gaming community is that way and that is why we have this show Mm -hmm. we want everybody to have wonderful sessions so we researched another topic again i wouldn't even say we researched it much you did some research i did some research because i wanted to see a if more information had been culminated and kind of where do a vibe check on we, the community we accidentally picked up another game a, a, a game rule system. set yeah, yeah. <laughs> another which, rule set which honestly helped i like i it more confirmed some of the stuff that we knew and yeah. and gave yeah. us another thing that we're probably going to go and take a look at we'll yeah. probably do it as a system spotlight too so. uh, i i thought it was great uh uh so the, the game system we are we're uh, sort of dancing around because we we are going to come back and do a system spotlight on it at some point is uh uh, uh knights black Age. Agents, is it? Yes, which yeah. is based on the Gumshoe core system, and uh, so we thought, you know, it's it's a lot about mysteries and investigation stuff like that, and uh, I wouldn't say that it told us anything necessarily that we didn't know before, but what it did do was it gave us some some distinct language to describe things that we do reflexively, and. Uh, that's why I think one of the very valuable parts about uh, like the show that you know do, doing the show in the first place is yeah. that like we do a lot of stuff reflexively just because we've been doing this for twenty five years each. Yeah. yeah. But uh, uh, then you have to try to teach it to somebody else, and you're like, what, what do you what do you even call this? You know, exactly. What, how, how do I describe my process? How do I show my work? And luckily, there's a lot of people out there who either a have made dissertations out of it, or b Say it, and then we're like, "Oh yeah, that's it." Oh yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the thing I do. That's, that's the word. Yeah. Oh so, my god, that is the thing I do. <laughs> that's why you've heard us saying the word "hard move" so much lately, yeah. because uh, that that's my new vocab term. And I, I no, I think I, it's I love. the other reason why I think we we use those terms is we're trying to create universal terms for the community that the community is using at large. Yeah, like let's yeah. let's get to a point where we're not talking about D and D terms. Let's talk about role playing oh, terms absolutely. Absolutely. in a more generic sense. But we can define what these things are and help people who aren't like 
10 year veterans of, of writing or editing mm-hmm. or, or, you know, or a, a movie script writing or whatever, you know? And I, I, look, I, I think that's uh, to an extent that's already happening. Like we were talking yeah. to somebody at the, uh, the, the game store the other night. And, oh God. Uh, yeah. They were, they were, we were talking about the ubiquity of the X card nowadays, which I think is great that that was instantly identified by somebody. Yeah. Like, who, who was a, by badge alone, a board game nerd. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Which is funny, because we then told them about Jake Shea, and they were like, oh, it's like a board game, role-playing game? We were like, yeah, go on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, tonight we are talking about mysteries, um, and crafting mysteries, and I think, for me, the one, if I had to say an opening moment about this, or a discussion point that I'm going to say is, you're not writing a novel. This isn't a movie or a TV series. So if you're seeing something like Hercule Poirot or, or a Sherlock Holmes or a Nancy Drew or, yeah, any of those things, like that is, you're not going to get that. Yes. Agreed. Don't, don't set that expectation for yourself. We're going to help you understand what is, what comes from those that are good and the expectations that comes out of that that are bad Mm -hmm. that you never want to have. Um, so. You started at, interest, at a certain talking point, and I like it. I uh, like where your reference starts from. Yeah. So uh, for, for me, um, it, this is an interesting topic because, like I was saying before the show, uh, it's this is one of those topics where, like, uh, I I didn't think I knew very much about it. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, well, I'm just going to jot down the things that I do know, and then we'll fill in the blanks. And I, I wrote, like, a page and a half of notes. And I was like, oh, whoops. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in in the where I where I start off with with mysteries is always working backwards. Never write a mystery forward. Okay, and by what I what I mean by that is, don't think I'm gonna write a clue, and that clue will lead to another clue, and that clue will lead to another clue, and then that will lead to some mystery that I'll that I'll determine. Right. Um, that's kind of working chronologically forward. Um, and. It, your mystery will tend to come out very disjointed that way because you're trying to arbitrarily link one – you're trying to link cause to effect to produce an endpoint rather than starting with the cause of all of it and then exploring all the effects that ripple off of it. So my very first piece of advice is start with the event, start with the inciting event and work backwards. Um, so for instance – um. Someone was murdered. You know, that's your typical, your typical murder mystery, right? Mm-hmm. All right. Someone was murdered, um, by someone else because they were jealous. All right, cool. You've got the event. Yes. Now, we know that they, they were murdered. Obviously, mm-hmm. that's going to be the inciting event. Yep. Everybody's going to be like, oh, we need to find out who did this. Right. All right. So what are we looking for when we're working backwards? Sure. We already know someone was murdered. How did it happen? They were stabbed. All right, cool. Sure. What happened to the murder weapon? Perfect. Why was that murder weapon chosen? Right. Uh, was this a crime of passion? Was this a um, mistake? A, a planned murder? Yeah. Was it you know a situation that got out of hand? Mm-hmm. You know what not? Think of all of these things, and then think of what they look like after the fact. Right. Think of all the effects that those will have. Right. And then. Leave those pieces around your story then for your players to, to, to go and pick up as clues. Now, I'm going to add one caveat to this in the, in your thought pattern, which comes kind of back to what I was saying, which sure. is um, something we're going to discuss later. Is, and I'm, I'm going to reference this later is if you are going to be doing this, make sure that you either make it very, very clear that you have a mystery being set for your players uh, yeah. or you literally preempt your in meta. By the way, tonight we are starting a mystery. Mm-hmm. So that immediately puts your players' investigative hats on versus their I'm going to go out and murder things hat or the this is a political intrigue hat or whatever. Or, or worse yet, the I'm not interested in this hat. Right. Where they're just like, oh, man, a mystery. And now you're like, maybe we won't do that tonight. Yeah, oh, OK. You know, well, what you don't want is uh, uh, for them to be like, OK, so, you know, you you kill all the goblins in the cave and you find a mysterious totem. OK. OK, cool. So the goblins were into some freaky stuff. Let's loot their let's loot their court, their, their dungeon, you know, their 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 uh, treasure and, yeah. and get out of here. Yeah. 
and nobody asks any questions because it seems like a non sequitur. They don't know right. they should ask some questions about it, you know, right. or and, and or likely as well as like you you've put bodies all over the place of other adventurers to denote that the goblins have been killing other adventurers. Mm -hmm. Great. So they, they get extra gear. Oh, wonderful. Extra loot. Cool. You know, that, thanks. Yeah. That's really cool. Like, that's what they're thinking. When in truth, you're trying to lead them through a story that will lead them into another adventure, yeah. maybe. If, if they take that hook. No, don't do that. So don't, don't, do that. don't be afraid to telegraph it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, again, we are not doing a movie right. where you're expecting them to stumble into the adventure. But I think, I think these examples actually, um, lead into my next point pretty handily. Um, and yeah. that is, okay, so you've got your inciting event. Now you want to leave those clues scattered for everybody. And uh, the best way to do this that I have found is environmental storytelling. Okay. Don't – what environmental storytelling is for, for uh, those who don't know the term is uh, when you, you use the environment to describe what happened rather than saying what happened. Okay. So, for instance, if I say – you walk into my kitchen. There is a uh, sort of a, a sweet smell in the air. You can definitely tell something has been cooked recently. The oven is still warm. On the countertop, you see a dusting of fine white powder. You see a slightly used thing of vegetable oil. You see a couple broken eggshells. Um, and as you glance over into the trash can, you see an empty can of uh frosting okay what happened in this room somebody was baking yeah what did they bake probably a cake yeah they exactly. may have even put some frosting on it yeah exactly yeah okay but i never said they baked a cake i never said that there was even a cake present correct but i have just given you environmental storytelling and you put those things together right i gave you evidence of an event that happened right is it important that that evidence be recognized as an event? Did I have to search for it? No. Those were all factual things that were set in motion in the right scene. Right in the room description. Yeah. Yeah. And we talk about – we've talked about environmental storytelling. If you've been on the show for a while or maybe you're just starting, um, back in April of 2021, we did a whole episode 103 on environmental storytelling with maps, which is great. Uh, it's a great place to start because you can literally present your players a visible evidence yep. of what's going on. Yep. Um, this works in both large scale maps, small scale and micro. Um, same with December 2019, which if you roll way back, it's episode 31. Oh my God. 31. We were, we were babies. Two digits. Please be uh, gentle. We were babies. Where we went back through environmental storytelling and we did talk a little bit about there, like you just did a, a scene description mm -hmm. where we're expressing more about, it. I think back in that one, we were actually talking about the, uh, gelatinous cube mm -hmm. or, or not gelatinous. The pots that were eating the the cubes that came out of the, like the out of the floor. Uh, no, it was like a like a well system. It was cleaners. It, yeah, you yeah. You had yeah. in the one dungeon, and I, I, it. Oh, it was, we, just, it was a black pudding. Yeah, we knew yeah. it was there, but we just didn't know what it was. Acrid smell in the air. There's no dust in this section of the uh, of the dungeon. Oh crap. Yeah. <laughs> like. <laughs> yep. It's very clean. Very clean. Uh, and then. But those two things uh, were previous ones. You can definitely read those. They go in a lot more detail of what we mm -hmm. just went over. So we're going to kind of skip past that. Um, the only other thing um, that I threw in here at the opening before we really get into the heavy details so that we can talk about it, and, and again, we'll be making sure you remember this, is a mystery must have a definite resolution where you close everything. Yeah. Don't leave things open. I know people who are still pissed to this day that there were things left open in the TV show Lost. It just drove them mad. Oh, yeah, but they were writing that off the, off the seat of their pants. Again, what are most t tabletop games? Yeah, well, they didn't start with the inciting incident Correct. and then Correct. work their way backwards. They went, so, wouldn't it be cool? So imagine now that you're the actor. <laughs> yeah. And now everyone asks you what's going on with this thing. You are that person. You're the character. Mm -hmm. Those players are going to be pissed at you. Yeah. Forever. Yeah. Yeah. So don't, don't do that. Always make sure you're closing up your mysteries. Give them answers. Make sure that you're comfortable with those answers. You like, finish it in an act. Get it mm -hmm. done. Get it out of there. Yep. Start a different quest. Agreed. Agreed. All right. Let's talk about how to build out a mystery 
and what components you really need. Now that you have your incident, we've got some stuff laid out. We know how it happened. Mm -hmm. What else? All right. Uh, well, I mean, every mystery needs clues. Yeah. Yeah. Like blues. <laughs> yeah. Blues clues. Blues right. Clues. Um, so, okay. The, your, your mystery is going to live and die off of its clues. You 100%. Need, you need to breadcrumb your players from one clue to another to another so that they can piece the whole picture together and at the end of the day know the at least enough details about the inciting incident to solve what the mystery is. Identify the killer, find the missing item, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. Um, now, the first thing to remember about clues is to make them accessible. Okay. If your players can't find the clues, or they can't get to the clues, or they can't understand the clues, then they cannot solve the mystery. Period. Yeah. And that's no fun for anybody. The last thing you want when running a mystery is for your players to be sitting around going, oh, I don't know what we're supposed to be doing right now. Right. And you're frustrated because you're like, man, if you'd have just made your perception check in the last room, you'd know. Right. But the dice screwed you, so now, now I don't know. Exactly. Exactly. We talk about this with uh, traps too, and yeah. in a very similar way. Is like you know, it's a tr it's a room puzzle, which is a mystery. It's just done in a single room. Again, your players have to know what to look for, and then trapping those things behind high TNs or even a TN. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes is it now? I I will say this. Um, there's a a good rule, and that is is that if you need your players to draw a conclusion. Give them three clues to do it and make those very clear. Yes. So if the conclusion is this man was shot, mm -hmm. he was not poisoned, he was not hung, he was shot. And that's an important part of this, right? Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that you have three clues available to them. There is a gun lying on the floor. It is missing a bullet from the chamber. When you walk into the room, you smell a sulfurous scent in the air. Yeah. Smells like burnt gunpowder. Yeah. If you have a gunslinger in your group, he can clearly identify the scent as gunpowder. Exactly. In the wall behind the man, you see a distinct hole the size of a small coin. And within it, you find the remnants of a bullet. Yes. You know, and it that that clearly had passed through and taken damage because there's blood on it. Yes. So now you have three clearly well-defined, you know, clues beyond even the body. Which mm -hmm. may or may not be there. That could be a whole other thing. Someone was in this room. They were shot. The bullet didn't stay inside of them. Okay, there, there's part of the mystery. Yeah. Right? But you've given three clues. You know someone was shot in this room recently. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. None of that needs to be walled behind a test. If you do want to do that, you can have other types of – you can have other beneficial clues – that add on, but that is the core. You need them yes. to be able to get to a conclusion within the space with those clues. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, I, and I, I would say the other thing too is, um, uh, you know, if you, if you are going to do checks or something like that to find clues and whatnot, um, I would say, uh, put other benefits or bonus clues behind checks yes not not the base clues themselves like walking in you will find these three clues i'm not even going to make you roll for that right well let me do an investigation check okay, okay cool no problem right you roll really high on it maybe you impress one of the investigators and they let you in on a theory that they've been working on, on about what happened here. Right. Okay. Maybe you don't even find anything extra, but it's just the fact of how you're going about the investigation that gets you that extra information. Maybe you do find not only these three clues, but one or two extra little details that might help you along. Right. Like one of the things that, uh, that I think is a great way is that players who aren't just doing search checks, maybe they're going to talk to the maid who cleaned the room before, who, who was, who, the, who came in the room to find it. Yeah. And like, her, you know, and does a really good job. So besides the information that's already been reinforced there, she also says, and the window was open. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's an extra piece of information. It's usually closed. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Now, now we have another thing that could lead out from that moment. And that actually leads us into uh, another really great um, way of dropping clues. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, this is our favorite way of doing it is floating clues. Yes. Yes. Um, so floating clues are clues that don't have to be tied to a specific source. Okay. Right. Now, the advance, example you just gave, the maid saying that the window was open. Right. Okay. That 
may you may not have to talk to the maid to get that information. Exactly. There may be a number of ways of getting that. A perception check. Uh, well, no, aside from that, but just different sources. Right. Right. As well. So in your notes, it may say the maid knows that the that the window was open because she was the one that closed it. Okay. What if the group never talks to the maid? Okay. What if instead they're like, I'm going to talk to the butler. Right. He buttles, sir. Yep. Um, yeah. Is there any reason why the butler wouldn't know that detail? Couldn't know that detail? Is it important that it comes from the maid? Or could the butler just be like, yeah, the maid said the window was open. That was weird. Yeah. And now you've just given that information to them. Yeah. Um, there, there's a, there's a different a number of ways. I think probably your prime example for this, and I think we use this exact example back in episode 31, mm-hmm. was um, uh, they're looking for like an important clue uh, while tossing someone's office. Yes. Now that clue is supposed to be locked in the safe that's hidden mm-hmm. behind the painting in the wall. Yep. They never look behind the painting in the wall, but it's a vital clue. Yeah. But they do rifle through the desk. Cool. The clue is now in the desk. Yep. Now it's in the desk. It does not matter Correct. what it says in your in your in your notes. Yeah, and and that's the thing is is that if you do want to put things behind heavier tests, you can do that. If you mm-hmm. if you're like, you know what, my group is really into investigation, and some of my players are really going to want to dig. Sure, put something behind a vital test, or make it so that if the test, like in some cases, might has multiple raises. Mm-hmm. You can add in there. So while rifling through, you find a painting, and behind it is a locked safe. You yeah. also, you know, and you're able to get into it and find X. Great. Make it something awesome. Mm-hmm. I'll, uh, and I, I do kind of go back to the supernatural style, meaning it's not the skill that did it, but something otherworldly in the sense of like as as you're rifling through, a note falls off the desk and you see the name and pick it up. Mm-hmm. Now you have additional information. It wasn't anything special about your rifling, but you just happened across the one key piece. Sure. Coinc- you know. Coincidence is just as good as good investigation. You know, like, yeah. you know, thing- things just falling into your lap is just as good as, as you know, finding it through skill. Exactly. And deduction. Yeah. Like, it, you you got it. Yeah. And and the great thing about floating clues is that just like any other detail that you as the storyteller have to change on the fly, um, your players never know. Yeah. All they know is that they searched the desk and that paid off. Mm-hmm. Go them. Yeah. They feel great. Yeah. That, that their investigations are, 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 are yielding results. Yeah. They don't know you moved it from the safe to the desk. Yeah. And also don't feel like you're not doing enough prep. Your prep is that you have to write about the clues. Like these are floating clues. Mm-hmm. Just write the floating clues and then decide where you want to insert them or if you do. Yeah. If there's a logical point where you can get that, that information, then, then do it. Do it. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, the mystery that that I'm currently running in in my game. Yeah, that yeah. we're really kind of past the mystery phase. We're we're into the okay. Let's let's we're get in it resolution. Yeah, we're yeah. in resolution phase. Yeah. Well, um, no, there's not, still there's still, there's little still elements, but I think we're we're at the uh, we're we're coming to the end where the investigator has everybody in the room and he's like, ah, but there's one thing that still buggles my mind. You, you know, you've, <laughs> you've solved the who done it. You don't know why done it. Right, is right the, is the difference. You know, it, but I got this theory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just one thing that's bothering me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, but anyways, like in 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 that one though, um, like one of the big floating clues I had was uh, when um, Sean's character and uh, our rogue went to go talk to uh, the uh, hierarchist of the Mages Guild, and I didn't know what they were going to ask him or anything like that. Right. You know. Uh, but they were like, okay, so what do you know about vampires? What can you tell us about what's going on here? You know, and rolled really super high. Mm -hmm. So he was like, you know what? You're from the mages guild too. I think I can trust you. Here's what's going on, you know? And it gave me an, it was an unplanned scene. Mm -hmm. It was entirely initiated by the players. I knew that that character had a certain place in the events that was going on. Right. I didn't feel like I never had it written in any of my notes that like, you know, if asked, he will say blah, blah. You know, it was yeah. just like, you know, he knows things about this. They rolled really high. Let's call this a floating clue. Mm-hmm. Let's let's just give him a chunk of information and see what they do with it. Yeah. It makes sense that these people would get this information out of him. Yeah. Um. 
and then they rolled really high to call BS on him. That's and this is what I'm going to say shifts into our next piece. And I said, and and I got to tell them, yeah, and that wasn't even the whole truth. You can tell he's holding something back, but you can't tell what. Yeah, and and that's where the I think the next phase of that comes into, which is leverage clues. Uh huh. Now a leverage clue clue. An unobvious way of doing it is when you bring up a clue to someone to gain more information. Right. A a good example is when uh, in your game uh, we had the Thieves Guild kick in the door and they literally put me to the wall and they were just like, you know, where is this girl? And I'm like, you don't even know where she is. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be doing this, which then kicked open a whole – like at that point their hand was played. Now – there's more information to be had. Yep. It's a leveraged point. That's a, a kind of a direct way. Or when you look at somebody and you're like, you you know, you know that person was at the scene of the crime. And so you return back to them and you're like, you didn't tell me you were at the bar at six o'clock. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I was just, I was dropping things off there. You're leveraging. Mm-hmm. So that's a very direct thing. There are some indirect leverages that work just as well. Um, the uh and the but the idea is is that you're taking one piece of evidence one one clue and confronting someone with it to get another clue out right, of them to, or a confession to push the dominoes yeah. down the line if you will and it may not be the confession that solves the murder mystery or whatever no. but it is maybe a confession of like you know you told me you were not in town but here I have this picture of you you know at the club the other night yeah. Isn't it true, Mrs. Darfa, that uh, you and uh, Mr. Darfa okay, were married? Okay, fine, I lied about yeah, that, yeah. yeah. But here's why I lied, because blah, 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 and now you get another clue out of them. Right, and sometimes you can turn around some of the other components, like uh, misdirection or red herrings. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that same sense, you can break those down and start getting yes. answers. Yes, so, exactly. So remember that players may do leverages on you. Oh, yeah. And that's where a floating crew clue can come back out, or you can you can help them kill a red herring now what or, is, or a, a misdirection this isn't in our notes but i do want to add this in um, mm-hmm. especially especially when writing npcs for a mystery arc mm-hmm. always have notes on what that npc will do if pressured yes where they will run to who they who they how they will react out of anger or fear or whatever yeah um and how and how involved in you know, things that they are, you know, so. Yeah. And, and keep in mind that, like, it's fantasy. Mm-hmm. This isn't reality, but you can play a little into that. A, a dude who isn't paid anything, who is just in the wrong place at the wrong time, probably will just fold. He's not getting paid enough for it. Yeah. They're like, this isn't worth it to them. On the other hand, someone who's already under a lot of stress may just cry and break. It may be a a, a chunk moment from Goonies where he literally lays out everything he's ever done in his entire life. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, down from, like, tattletailing on his little brother to, to, like, stealing cookies, you know? Yeah. But, but I mean, it's, it's good to know if, you know, like, if they are going to confront somebody, like, you know, well, I've got this piece of evidence that says that you lied, are they going to lash out violently? Right. Are they going to just crumple, you know, just... Are they going to smoke bomb and try and escape? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just at least know that much so that when your players do inevitably try to leverage them, you at least have that, that, uh, you, you can at least improv in a direction rather than improving blindly, you know? Uh, all right, my my next point is don't rely on your players to be expert investigators. Um, <laughs> this is uh, probably one of the biggest things where it's like you you think that um, you think you're laying out all the all the evidence correctly, but yeah. you need to remember that first off, your characters may be in that room experiencing thing with all five senses. Yeah. But your players who play those characters are sitting around your dining room table or over Discord, mm-hmm. only hearing a a word audio voice description right. of a few things that they see in the room. Right. Okay. Um, so when they don't immediately jump on your word use and say, okay, well, he said this, so that must mean this, and I know who the killer is. Yeah. Don't be surprised. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that this kind of comes back to make sure they understand it's a mystery. Yeah. Like, make sure they first of all understand it's a mystery, but also I think this is a great use case for the role then result. Yes. Um, sort of style of, of adjudicating roles. Yes. Okay. We've talked about this a bit before with our, um, 
uh, with our social interactions. Mm-hmm. Like your players, you know, like my, my boyfriend does not have, you know, the gilded silver tongue of, of Thalian Arroway, his, uh, his, his character. I'd say 50% of the time he does, but. <laughs> oh, I mean, if he's a meme lord, don't get me wrong. Some, but... some of the stuff that comes out of him is, but I agree with you. Not all of us are our, none of us are, are our characters. Ex- exactly. And we don't expect the fighter to actually know how to swing a sword. We don't expect the wizard to actually know magic. So why do we expect our socialites to actually know how to um woo and seduce and fast talk and stuff like that or interrogate or interrogate exactly um and likewise we don't expect them to all be you know csis uh and be able to investigate a crime scene to the fullest extent of of their ability that's why we are playing a fantasy game so we can pretend to do all this stuff so um I would suggest highly, like, for investigation results and stuff like that, um, leaning more into a role than result style. Meaning, the player just sa- says, I'm going to investigate the crime scene. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Roll your investigation check. I don't need to know what you're looking at. I don't right. need to know how you're looking. Right. Just roll your investigation, and we'll handle it based on your role. If yeah. you rolled really high... I will say you were inspired to look here and here and you piece this together and you walk away with this clump of information. Mm -hmm. If you roll really low, maybe you just scan around and just nothing in this makes sense. It's just a bunch of – the room seems to be tossed and you can't really put hide nor hair together. Right. But again, when we're talking about this, you can sometimes hand things to your players, but you also may just let them role play a little bit and like – so, you know – Maybe one of your players is like, yeah, I waltz into the room and look at the CSI guys are there and start examining things over their shoulders. And like maybe I grab someone's pencil and pick up the gun so that I'm not touching the gun and I smell it and things like that. Okay, here's what you get off the crime scene. You know, you let them role play into it. Maybe they lead you to where you are going to place a floating clue, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's kind of great. But at the same regard, you may have a player who's like, okay, what happens? So you have to be prepared to be able to present them with the facts of what they find. <laughs> like I walk, I walk into the CSI. Like, okay, I walk in, I pull out my sunglasses, and I say, "Looks murdered at a Dungeons and Dragons game. Hmm? Looks like this victim tossed the dice and lost." Yeah! <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. And that's our show. Um, but at the same time, like. Physical inspections are important, um, but knowing what you're doing going into the scene and presenting some – again, some players may not even have a good visual for it. Mm-hmm. This is also a good point where you can hand props to people. So when you're doing physical uh, clues for a scene, have some. Would love that. And and yes. that, that also helps with the mystery factor because now they have a tangible thing in their hand that they've mm-hmm. found. Um I had a scene where the uh, in my game where the players found hieroglyphics on the wall, mm-hmm. and I needed to be able to translate some of that to you. And I found papers, and I gave you guys the physical pages of what it looked like. Yeah, so you yep. guys could read through it directly and get the notes off of those uh, and see what uh, what transposed off of that. And it helped get those informa- that information extra across because again, as I'm saying it, it's being read right in front of you. Well, and uh, aside from that, like some people, like myself, mm-hmm. don't process audio information easily. Right. Um, you know, we've talked about this a lot before, uh, mm-hmm. and this is kind of what made the uh, the NPC cards a thing amongst us was yeah. that you had like six or seven NPCs and three of them were talking to each other and yep. I could not process what was going on. I didn't remember any of their names or anything yep. like that. Suddenly you pull out little cards with a, with a face shot, their names spelled out, and a little snippet about them. And I was like I, – I followed everything mm-hmm. from that point forward. It was just having a visual thing for me, yep. you know? Yep. So even having like a, 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 a small map of the room or – uh, you know, some sort of – like you said, a physical a physical embodiment of a mm-hmm. – you know, a phys rep of a, of a, of a thing – can be super valuable to people. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be all that great. You can keep that stuff very simple. Or even just write out the room description and mm-hmm. hand it as a piece of paper so that they can go over and reread it and reread it. Yep. And figure out what's important there. Yep, exactly, exactly. You can also bold the things that are important. You can. Because you need them to get it. That's not meta That is literally moving your game forward. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, and that's, that's, I think, brings us actually to our next, uh, to our next, uh, next point. And that is, tell your players when they have a fact. 
Yeah. With so, a capital F, with a capital F, they have a fact. Yeah, and I would say it's agreed that if you, unless you're running a hardcore game with a bunch of mystery fans, and you're, you know, you want they they want to piece it all together. They're the ones who are pushing that edge of it. Yeah, by all means, if that's your vibe, go go ahead and skip this point. Yeah, and even the Gumshoe game is very clear about that, mm-hmm. like how you how you insert misdirection, red herrings, and things like that versus actual facts that are discovered. When your players make a roll, that's a fact. Mm-hmm. You know, if they stumble across something, that could be a misdirection. It could still be a fact, just not related. Yeah, but if they succeed on an investigation roll or whatever whatever mm-hmm. passes for one in your game system, give them a fact. Yes. And... We often run very long games. Mm-hmm. Long arcs, stories can last, like a single arc could last a year. Uh, I'm five game sessions into this short little arc. Yes. And uh, yeah. we're on uh, uh, episode 29 or something like that. Yeah. And that's only the, we're coming up on the beginning of act two of my three act game. Yeah. And I'm, what, 17 episodes into the final act of my game. Yeah. And I think my pre, the, the first act of my game had close to 60. Yeah. So when it was all said and done, it was while. ridiculous. Yeah. But the thing is, is that those games you want to move and not flounder based upon those facts. Mm-hmm. You, you never want those facts to get lost, you know, and that's, that becomes the hard part because as time goes on, your players have spent even less time as their characters. Yeah. And more time in real time, and their brains are in a hundred other places. And having to pull all of that knowledge back together, put the whiteboard back up with the little lines and everything in their heads, because you don't physically have that every single session, Mm -hmm. you know, unless it's deliberately a mystery game where you might, this gets very hard for them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We, we play, we play once a month if we're lucky. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's every month and a half or two months, depending on how, how the scheduling demon eats us. Yep. Um, but, uh, uh, I open up, especially, especially in this mystery section that I've been doing, Mm -hmm. um, with a recap of last session Mm -hmm. and listing the facts that everyone knows. You know this happened. Mm -hmm. You know this happened and you know this person did this thing to this person. Mm -hmm. And go. Yes. You know. Um, so that being said, like now, now that you've got your facts in place, one of the things that you have to be concerned about a little bit is is it okay to change the story like we have a mystery that's being uh, that is that is being unfolded but at the same time it's taking them six episodes to discover that this count was the one who killed somebody and that's really the turning point for act two Mm -hmm. was is now you've got to go after him in some way you have to have the proof like they need to know it but then they need to find the proof to, to, to really seal the deal. And it's taking them forever to do it. How, you know, is it okay to shift the game and cut things out or give them things early? Yes, 100%. Yep. If you're, especially if your players are struggling or they're frustrated. Yeah, yeah. Be prepared to shift your game. Yeah, look, it, the, the, the important part, even in a mystery, is to have fun. Yeah. And if your players just aren't figuring it out, don't be afraid to shift the tone at the table. Don't yeah. be afraid to shift back into a more action-oriented thing. Make the next clue that they learn the big one that breaks the case, even if it folds half of your, you yeah. know, If you need to tie a bunch of your floating clues to a character who comes in and presents it, there's nothing wrong with another inspector showing up and being like, I've discovered these things. And they're like... Well, that fits everything we have here. Right. Holy crap. Or or comes to them for help and is like, you know, I've only got half of the picture. I've got this clue, this clue, and this clue, but I just don't know what's going on with all this stuff. Yeah. And you're like, well, that's the stuff we've been investigating, but we didn't know any of the stuff you told us. Let's put our heads together and yeah. we've got this thing wrapped. Right. Or they have the one or two extra clues that are necessary. Sure. Sure. The last thing is, is that they can also be the person who helps turn them to the next phase. Yes. Exactly. Now. There, this also opens the thought that maybe you didn't catch all of your pieces. Maybe there's sure. a hole in your plot that you're like, mm. it happens to all of us. It does. All of us ha- have. Ha- it's happened to me a couple of times. Yeah. In this, and this a, a lot of times you, sometimes your players will look at you and give you a more rational answer for what 
was what seemed to be an irrational answer you put in. Yep, yep. Like the, you just you you kind of look at them when they when they go, well, that doesn't make sense, and you're like, yeah, I don't know, it's crazy. What do you think happened? And they're like, I think what happened is blah 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 blah, and you're like taking notes. That's right. Yeah, that's probably what happened. That makes a lot of sense, <laughs> you know. But you never say that. You yeah. just, you're just like, yep, that's exactly how it works. That's exactly how it went. Yeah. You know, and and that then allows you to tie that up add it in make sure that it fits and presents and moves on mm-hmm. um i can distinctly remember uh watching a 7c playthrough where a, a person had made this elaborate situation where a lord was basically uh skimming money uh-huh. uh from uh from someone else and everybody was just like why would he be doing it? Like they were all trying to prove that he wasn't the one doing it. That one of his henchmen were actually the people skimming from him. And it, they were like, well, one person literally asked was like, well, why would he be going to get the money? He's got a whole staff of people, including an honor guard who literally respect him. Mm-hmm. Like he would just have them do it. And it was, and the person was just like, yes, yes, th- that's exactly who's doing it. You're right. You know, and left turned the clues to be them Mm -hmm. and then it was a matter of once they found those guys they were like you know why are you skimming the money like skimming the money we were told to come down here and get it by whom our lord oh oh it really is the count after all yeah Yeah. and and that was the turn was they 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 just needed the information presented a different way that made rational sense yep 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 so now we kind of step into the misdirectional side of things with red herrings. Speaking of clues, making sense. Yes. Um, so you probably hear the term a lot, what a red herring is. Um, is uh, I'll be red... honest, I was bad at this. Yeah. I am still bad at this, at getting at the difference between a red herring and a misdirection. So if you don't get this right off the bat, listen carefully. All right. So a red herring is a clue that does not matter to the mystery. Okay, it is a literally an erroneous clue. It does not tie in in any way whatsoever. Um, now, oftentimes these are deliberately written into mystery stories uh, to draw the reader off of the trail of what really happened. Okay, you're given five clues, but only four of them actually matter. Right, and you spend all your time trying to figure out how that fifth clue sits in mm-hmm. that you miss what those other four clues are pointing towards. Right, okay. because. Because they could lead they there's you know two directions or three directions and f- all four of those clues work in all those directions mm-hmm. but that fifth clue kind of throws you off like well it doesn't fit with any of these. Now, it's worth noting that a red herring is never done deliberately. Mm-mm. Okay, a red herring is just something extra that is in the scene, uh, that is in the investigation, that is just there by coincidence. Now I'm I'm going to be careful about that. If a player is doing a search, they do not find a red herring. The red herring was present there before. Yeah, you should never give a red herring as a reward for a successful search. Right. And be careful not to give it on a failure as well, because that changes the whole thing up as well. Immediately flags it of like, oh, I rolled a nat one, so you gave me this clue. Right. You know. So just be be advised that when you're presenting clues that are not part of a a direct action by the player. It's mm-hmm. a description. Put it in the room. Uh, dirt by the window. Yep. You know, there's a whole murder sequence. You know, we, we have a gun. We have a dead body. We have a bullet in the wall. We have an open window. And there's dirt in front of the window. Okay. Well, how does the, what is the dirt for? The dirt is there because the cat knocked the plant over. It's a red herring, but the players are now going to worry, are going to try and keep that within the framework. Yeah. Uh, for me, I threw a red herring in, um, mm-hmm. uh, into mine because, uh, you guys were looking at the missing persons posters. Yep. You looked at the wanted poster for Yorda, mm-hmm. um, who's one of the two vampires that's going at it in the town. Um, and then there was another wanted poster for the gray fox, who's a, a, a famed thief. Yep. And you guys were like, how does – is the gray fox another vampire? Right. And then you started looking at all the other clues and you were like, the gray fox name has literally never come up other than that wanted poster. That must be a red herring. And you discarded it. Yes. Wisely because it was a red herring. Much like communism. Much like communism, yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) To to fit in the clue. To be clear, what red herrings are not is a misdirection. A misdirection is a clue – deliberately placed by someone to draw you off the trail okay um so if it's if it is in any way deliberately placed there it's not a red herring 
Right. So it's, it is a meaningful thing. It is when the bad guy literally cleans the gun, which was not used at the murder, and leaves it so it looks like it was the lieutenant's gun. He opened the window and then left through the door to right. make it look like he went through the window. Exactly. That's not a red, the window was not a red herring. The right. window was a misdirect. Correct. You're like, okay, so now, now we have something. If we look outside, there are, you know, there's, a direction for them to follow that is different than the people inside exactly. the house. They'll never guess that it was someone in the house who did it. Now, what I will say is red herrings are both a blessing and a curse. They Correct. are an absolute double-edged sword. Um, on one hand, they are realistic. Yeah. Mysteries are rarely ever clean. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of stuff to sift through. What's relevant, what's not. Um, lots of clues end up being red herrings just because they're just things that you look at and you're like, is that... Mm, excuse me, is that significant or is that not? Right. You don't know until you start investigating and you filter these things out. Yes. On the other hand, uh, depending on your group, depending on your mystery, how well it's structured, how well your players are following it and stuff like that, a red herring can add three game sessions to your to your mystery. Correct. Or hours to a specific session. Exactly. As they or investigate, why is the chair in the middle of the room, critical role fans? <sighs> But and that's the whole thing is is that in most cases, and I will flat out say this: in most cases, unless your players deliberately know that they are in a mystery, if you have put told them directly, mm -hmm. this next episode is a mystery, or you literally present them with, you know, the opening scene is the Baron saying someone has killed my wife. We need to find out who. Okay, that sounds uh, obvious, like a mystery. Obvious mystery setup. Right. You're, you have to be very deliberate about it. Otherwise, your players may look at everything as a plot point. Mm -hmm. Not as a mystery, but as a plot point. Yeah. And that that changes the whole tone of how they handle the scenes. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the big problem that I have with it. I would say in most cases, don't do it. You're not helping your players. On the other hand, if you're deliberately running a mystery and they're very clear with it, yeah, have some fun. Nobody likes a dead end. <laughs> I got. I got to admit, I did. I did the gray fo the, the gray fox thing on accident. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to world build. No, I. And then all of a sudden, you guys were like making theories about him, and I was like, oh no, right? Did did I did I just did I just add three game sessions to this? Oh no. Well, and I think there's a I, I think there's something to be said for that, but mm -hmm. at the same time, we were able to move away from it. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think the investigation moved at a decent enough clip, and you guys you guys had a a saturation of information enough that you realized that that was the odd bit out. Correct. And were able to ex isolate it and exclude it. Right. So. I would never have thought, or even. If you had asked me as a storyteller, hey, uh, it's two sessions in and you guys are still working on the great the, – the, my players are still working on the Gray Fox ag angle of this. Do I just change my story to include a reference that burns that out? If you're three sessions in and your red herring is still an active part of the plot, yeah, burn it. Burn it, yeah. Like, Make sure your characters have a dead end finished off of that. I have literally heard a story oh, about a Savage Worlds game where they were they were doing some sort of a mystery investigation, mm -hmm. and um, they got the group got so sidetracked on a red herring that literally they were like, okay, so we're investigating the warehouse, like there's nothing here, like really there's nothing here. What are we going? We're going through all the all the stuff that's in the warehouse. What's in the crates? It's like it's a, actually it's a bunch of barrels. Okay, what's in the barrels? Uh, they smell like fish. Actually, you look at the labels and they say red herring on the, on the barrels. Why would they be smuggling fish? Guys! Yeah. 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 I can't make it any more obvious. Yeah. On the other hand, I had a situation that I read about, uh, that was in, uh, it was a 7C story where players had uh, taken a ship and they were to find three clues on the ship and a fourth clue that was a red herring. Mm-hmm. They followed the red herring harder than any of the other clues. They were like, they're on the ship. There was, uh, there were, uh, there was gold mm -hmm. that was stolen from, uh, from basically Spain. There were documents about, uh, about, uh, cargo from Spain, uh, that were not from this ship, but from a ship from Montaigne. Mm -hmm. And there, the third clue was that uh, there was a manifest from a port in Montaigne about where that cargo was supposed to go to. Mm -hmm. So from those three things, we can say, well, someone stole cargo from Montaigne and got gold for it. Mm -hmm. 
Spanish gold for it. Okay, so we know there's something related to those two things. Great. We were, the third thing was a uh, was a manifest for an expedition. That was it. Like, oh, there's an expedition. Just a explorers guild are going to search an art search for artifacts. Suddenly, they were like Spanish gold, Montaigne merchant, and our our. It's a dual funded thing. It's the the Montaigne government is trying to you know is using uh, the Spaniards to go after these uh, you know rare artifacts. We have to figure out where this artifact is. Mm -hmm. Okay, three things pointed to something totally different. Uh, there's a war going on between Spain and Montaigne right now. That seems like a direct reference. This, this other thing is nope. Seven episodes later, they're oh still trying to hunt down the expedition team and what happened to him. He literally had the sh he, he said, okay, you find out that the ship had gotten sacked. You find out where it got sacked. You talk to one of the people from the ship. Like, we never made it. You know, we, we were out in the seas, and there was a merchant vessel that was under distress. And as we got closer, it was being attacked by another ship, the ship that they went and got mm -hmm. you know and they got we got caught up in it and scuttled and we were out floating waiting to be rescued you know they stole all of our cargo okay but where were you going at what point do you like step in out of character and just go like guys we are wasting so much time on this this is not a plot thread this is a red herring please get back to the investigation yeah. rule this one out so what he ended up doing was looping it back in. Uh huh. He basically had them follow the cargo of and, the expedition. And the cargo led back to the plot. It literally was inside the bad guy's building because he had all the cargo. Yep. Why not? Yep. So they were like, oh yeah, we followed this cargo crate and that's how we found you. And he was like, that cargo? Oh, you mean the meaningless stuff that we got from the expedition? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, no Knox brings up a good point. He says, "Sunken cost fallacy." We spent so much time on this; it must mean something. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's well put. To, well put on the sunken cost fallacy is an important thing. Once you get to a certain point, does it become a clue? And the answer is sometimes it has to be. Sometimes it has to. Yeah. Because, I guess. and this comes back to the one thing that I was saying about red herrings is the inherent problem with players coming to a dead end. Mm -hmm. That's fine in a book. That's fine in a TV show. You're you're invested in watching someone do it. Right. You right. are not the person who's now sunk 18 hours of your life into discovering something only to come to a dead end. Maybe maybe through like, you know, work and kids and family and yeah. you know, all, all this other stuff a nightmare of trying to schedule a game nowadays as adults yeah. with lives and six players in my game. Yeah. You know, I can't imagine wasting I've only got 5 hours every you know, every month and a half to do this with you guys. Yeah. I can't imagine spending 18 hours chasing a red herring. Yeah, no, no. That, that's, that's three whole game sessions. Like, yeah. Nobody's got time for that. Yeah, and, nobody got, and also to feel at the end that you got nothing for it. Exactly. That would exactly. be even the worst part. So if you get to a point where your players are frustrated and need to come to a closure, close it. If they're we're chasing a red herring, make it useful. Mm -hmm. Make it a floating clue suddenly. Like, just br bring them back into the plot. Yep. Make it part of the plot. Yep. And I, I, this steps into our very next point, which is the plot continues to move. Right. Mysteries are not – they don't need to be something that just happened and now they're just dormant. Right. Um, That the players need to piece together. Like, oftentimes, until a mystery is solved, like, the query of that mystery continues to act. Right. You know, you're on the trail of someone who maybe, you know, a serial killer or something right. like that or or a thief mm -hmm. or whatever. Um the murderer may continue to kill people. Mm -hmm. The thief may steal again, mm -hmm. etc. I mean, there, there. I, I, I give crime examples, but mm -hmm. there could be any number of things, any number of reasons you're you're, you're on a mystery. Um, right. And they don't only act as a doom clock for you because you know. I mean, like obviously, like if you're on the trail of a serial killer, you have an interest in catching that person as quickly as possible to save lives. Right. You know. Um. But. These sort of things not only function as a doom clock, but can add fresh evidence to the investigation. Agreed. So, for instance, like, um, a thief ste steals a valuable book. Mm -hmm. This book is part of a three-piece set of magic items that do a very specific thing. Mm -hmm. um, the group doesn't know what the motives of the thief were. Why mm -hmm. would they only steal the book? I don't right. understand. Um, but then a few nights later... As the investigation is progressing, the thief comes back and steals the bell and the candle that go with the book. Right. 
And now you're like, oh, okay, clearly if they stole those two other items, they know it's a set. Right. And they know what they're doing with it. And now, now you understand something about the thief. Right. Now you've got a story arc that goes, okay, well, what is he doing with these things? Right. Who might know that these three items were a set that do a specific thing? Right. And you've got some questions. You can move that, that thing forward. Yeah. But having, you know, having your killer kill again or having your thief steal again or, um, like in, in, in mine, um, mm-hmm. Uh, I had, uh, you know, one of my vampires was trying to whip up an angry mob mm-hmm. and tried to, and tried to make you do it for them. Yep. Um, you know, these, these are the things that, you know, until that force is stopped, until that mystery is solved, you have action that is continuing to happen. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's a great way of putting it. Um, another point to that is also, uh, in continuational plot is, yeah, so you've got your thief. The thief has told me things. The the lingering question can often be, who is this thief? Mm-hmm. Not only so much like who they are physically so we can get them, but also like who are they as a person? Like why did they steal these? Are they a, a magic user? Are they Like clearly there's more motivation, and that's oftentimes when you find the thief, they're dead. Somebody right. else killed them. Right. And now you – that leads to the next mystery. That opens the next door. Yeah. And that's where mysteries can unfold. The other thing that I wanted to bring up when, when we're talking – we're not talking about, you know, the the more direct stuff because a lot of times we talk about combat. We talk about, you know, darker themes like, you know, murder, thief, things like that. Sure, sure, There's sure. There's nothing to say that this couldn't be – and I, I always go back to the high school small setting. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, one of the problems with uh, with ongoing plots like this, especially in a social setting, is often one lie leads to another lie and they get grander and grander until they unfold themselves. Mm-hmm. So there's nothing to say that – all of the people involved, these people you're questioning who are trying to hold back the truth, aren't eventually going to break. They aren't, they're going to come to a head at some point, and it will unravel itself in front of the players. Yeah, absolutely. So that's something else that you, you always have to keep in mind is that the pressure of time is not only on your players, but also on your NPCs. Mm-hmm. Things will unravel at some point. We all say that, you know, once you, or I shouldn't say we all say, but we, we, we've read the concept that the more people involved in keeping a secret, the less of a secret it can possibly be. Yeah. So, and that inevitably grows with time Mm -hmm. because it has to. (laughs) That's why I don't believe in conspiracy theories. It's if you try try to get ten people to keep to 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 all you know work on a project together. Yeah. Yeah. Now, can you imagine hundreds of thousands of people all working on a project together and keeping their mouths shut about it? No, 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 that doesn't happen. That does not happen. There's a reason why we know about Area 51. Yeah. There's a reason why we know about everything that we know about. And the more fa- – the faster the information is that is available and the more readily it is able to have that communication, mm-hmm. the faster that it happens. The only reason why in medieval times it was easy to keep secrets was because someone controlled the, the rate the, the information moved around. Yeah. Yeah. And you just can't really do that anymore. There's too many methods. Mm-hmm. So keep that in mind also in your in your stories is that – as technology increases and as communicational availability increases, so does the plot's speed of unraveling. Mm-hmm. So, all right, uh, we have one question today. Wonderful, uh, and that is from the Mad Elf. Uh, what would you say are good systems and/or settings that are that are a good fit for mystery games? Uh, so there are there are a handful of game systems that are mm-hmm. that are specifically geared to investigative playstyles. Yes, um, I would agree. Uh, Call of Cthulhu is that is it's bread and butter. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, it's bread and butter. Um, is the investigative game? In fact, um, like a uh, friend of the show, Seth Skorkowski, mm-hmm. uh, even said was like, you know, don't tell people that Call of Cthulhu is horror. They won't want to play it then. Most people don't like horror. Mm -mm. Tell them it's an investigative game and you're investigating spoopy stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's true. Yep. It's, it's, that's absolutely true. You can, you can lay off the, the gore and the everything, you know, that doesn't mm-hmm. have to be as much of a part of the game as much as it is your investigators investigating the paranormal. There's nothing to say it's not X-Files. Yeah, exactly. X-Files was spoopy and scary at times. Sure. But spoopy, definitely. But spoopy, yeah, absolutely. Um, you, um, you talked about Night Black Agents. Night's Black Agents, yeah. Um, uh, and the entire gumshoe system. Which also, I think it's, uh, um, uh, is Conspyramids is the, is the, uh, like way that they talk about it within uh night black Agents. oh a, a mix of conspiracy and pyramid yes um and then you have dresden files 
is another one that's really good for that. It's based off the fate system. Yep. Um, and uh, I would say any time uh, – any system or s- I'll start shifting to sh- settings, I would say, mm-hmm. um, that really do it is – any time where you've got a point of interest and a, a group mm-hmm. that is designed to go for that, where it's specifically put into it, I think a good example of of that is um, SCP is a fantastic discovery one. Sure, yeah. I mean, it's literally a setting designed to to find out what's going on. Yeah, like that's the whole thing. Yeah. Um, Aliens is another great example of a mystery thing because oftentimes you are going out and discovering what's going on in a grand sense. I would actually say there's a handful of those free league games that uh, that, are, yeah. that are good. Like Tales from the Loop I feel mm-hmm. like is really good uh, for investigative sort of stuff. Like a, a weird thing that happens but like – and it's it's like low stakes weird stuff. Yeah. You know, like, oh, there's a weird time anomaly. Let's figure out what's going on with yeah. it. Kids um, on bikes. Kids on bikes, great. Yeah, uh, or any of that uh, loopal genre. Kids on, boom, uh, on broomsticks, yeah. etc. Yeah. yeah, all those fit within that. Um, so I, I, again, you're talking about a a case where the point of question for the story, where mm-hmm. where the story is going, is not so much a widescape adventure as it is a place that has an event occurring. Yeah, and and I think with that framework phrased exactly that way. Um, I, I mean, I think the real answer to the question of what good systems or settings there are for mystery games is any of them. Yeah, you can think, technically do with any of them. Mystery is one of the one of the easiest um, storytelling genres to transplant into just about every game. You can you can do game, uh, mystery just as easily in Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition. As you can in Call of Cthulhu, as you can in Savage Worlds, as you can anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Because it is a type of story, it doesn't rely necessarily on a set of mechanics to make that happen. Not, not to say that, uh, that the mechanics aren't, don't make it a little more difficult for certain classes and stuff to be able to engage. Sure, I because mean, Because socializing, have... socializing is not a major part of D&D. Yeah, unfortunately your barbarian is probably, it probably isn't going to be proficient in investigation or, inter- or, you know, they might be an intimidation. Yeah. They might be able to get some, some information out of people that way. Right. So I, I think at that point you have to get creative about how you're implementing it and what you're allowing for in it. Because obviously if you've got a group of players where one's a talkie, one's a smarty, one's a thug, you know, mm-hmm. and another thug and then another thug in a different way. Uh, you center of the fireball goes here. Yeah, exactly. You have to be prepared to to allow them to taunt or to interrogate, you know, and use their skill set to be able to do that, whether they're noble or honorable or whatever. But – that fits really anywhere else. You have to look at the makeup of your group that's going in to be able to handle that. If yeah. I'm doing it in Shadowrun and all of my guys are edge lord gun knife bunnies, okay. So that's the angle that I have to remember they're going to take most of the time. Mm-hmm. They're going to they're going to sneak in, they're going to interrogate, they're going to maybe hack a little bit, but they're not going to go socialite with anybody. Yeah. Like that's yeah. not going to be a conversation. Somebody may respect them because of what they are and that will change the way I deliver it. Yeah, I mean there's there's definitely a, a, a vibe check you want to do at the table first um to see yeah. if a mystery is even going to fit the game style, but but I mean it was, it was just a generic thing like you can you do mystery in 5th edition? Yeah, sure, yeah, of course sure. sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, but again, if you're looking specifically to do mystery, like if you want to run a mystery game, there are plenty of systems that do it well and give you all the framework mm-hmm. and roles to handle it. Yeah, absolutely. But you you can do it with anything, literally any. You could do it with dread. Yeah, simple system doesn't matter. You could nothing you could. wrong with that whatsoever. Alrighty. Uh, so next week's topic, oh, um, <laughs> handful of shows ago, uh, we did my campaign breakdown. Uh, this time is Rob's turn. He's going to be in the hot seat, uh, taking you through his campaign from start to finish, from conception to execution. Yeah. I'm, I'm still stressing a little bit about it because like the scope and scale of mine is in, in my own head is gigantic. At the same time, I have to like talk about 10 years. Well, of stuff. you have to talk about a lot of stuff, but we did take a pretty decent hiatus in the middle of it. So. We did. We did. And I made some shifts. So I can – there's going to be some stuff to discuss, like my own version shifting that I did. So mm-hmm. Absolutely. But I think we'll have fun with it. 
Uh, you can find us on Twitter at ST underscore Conclave, on Instagram, ST underscore Conclave. Listen to us live every Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time on MixLR.com slash Storyteller dash Conclave. And join us up on our Discord. Uh, we've had a lot of new blood in the Discord uh, yeah. lately. Uh, we're really thankful to see all those new faces. Um, get up there, uh, join the discussion, shoot us some questions. You can find that link uh, to our Discord on our Twitter, as well as our website, StorytellerConclave.com. We'd like to thank our Patreon members who support us every month, especially our name members, Knox in the Box, Sam, the Arcane Asylum, Sparkle Motion Veteran, Subjet, and Hulavu. We really appreciate your support. Our pre-show music is by Arcane Anthems. You can find that at patreon.com slash arcane anthems. Our intro music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. You can find that at geefrog.bandcamp.com and also on YouTube, I found out, or Amazon. You can purchase his tracks. Oh, very nice. It's wonderful. Uh, our outro music is Only Our Footprints in the Sand by Meteor Machine. You can find that at freemusicarchive.org. Big shout out as always to our families, Vicky and Sean. Thank you so much Thank for you. loving and supporting us. All of our friends have sat us at our tables and solved our mysteries over the years. <laughs> or didn't. And you, every single one of our listeners. We love you so much. Love you all. Good night. Good night.